Hello, and welcome to Ideas Having Sex with Chris Kaufman. I'm Chris Kaufman, and each show I bring to you an interesting and provocative scholar to discuss topics in social science, philosophy, history, politics, and more. If you enjoy what I do, please take a minute to subscribe to the show and to give us a rating and review wherever you listen. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Ideas Having Sex. I'm Chris Kaufman, and today I am joined by professors Rachel Ferguson and Marcus Witcher. We are discussing their new book, Black Liberation Through the Marketplace, Hope, Heartbreak, and the Promise of America. Rachel, Marcus, thank you for joining me. Thanks so much for having us. Glad to be here. Do you guys want to give a brief outline of what this book is about, what your main purpose in writing it is, and what gaps do you think this book fills? Yeah, sure. I'll jump in and just say that I was thinking about issues of uh, race. I I live very close to Ferguson, Missouri, and helped to support some of the entrepreneurs in town after the um, unrest there. And I was thinking about the fact that being in the liberty movement all my life, which now I'm 46, so it's been decades, I'm actually aware of a lot of great work on race and discrimination coming out of classical liberal and libertarian scholars, but people don't think of us when they think about race and discrimination. And so I thought somebody should put all this in one place. And that was really the the initial inspiration for the book. And so that's the gap, I think, that's that's filled. It's not so much that classical liberals don't think about this issue as much as we have a lot of really good research on this or that historical period or certain kinds of economic insights, but they're all scattered around. And so we just needed someone to bring it together and say, this is the classical liberal presentation on Black American history. And at the same time, we ended up discovering, which was really delightful, that there's quite a history of classical liberal activism on this topic as well. So that was really wonderful. Marcus, did you want to jump in with anything? Yeah, for sure. I just want to add, um, you know, Rachel had this sort of idea to bring all these different ideas together and to present them in one place. Um, And the way that we sort of got uh, connected was that she needed or she thought she needed a historian to come uh, and join her on the project. And so she reached out to my advisor, the civil rights historian, David Beto, and and Beto uh, put us together um, and so we've been working on the project, Rachel, for what, like three years or something like mm-hmm. that? So it's, yeah. uh, it's nice to see it finally come to fruition. And we think that what we've presented in Black Liberations in the Marketplace is a single volume in which you can go to it and you can get a broad overview of sort of Black history in America. And we think that we've tr- kind of filled a void that's really needed in American sort of discourse. So the left has a tendency to say, listen, you know, um, America's institutions are just fundamentally racist. We should throw them out the window because we can't address past injustice with these institutions. Um, and we we don't think that's the case. Um, we think that we need to address past injustice. But the reality is, um, is that, you know, the actual founding sort of like principles of liberalism and market liberalism, if you will, are actually quite sound. And so to our friends on the left, we say, listen, you know, real injustice has happened, but the best way to address it is by affirming, right, our founding values rather than uh, jettisoning them. And to our friends on the right, we say, listen, you know, the founding values are great, but they haven't been equally applied, right? The just rule of law has not been equally applied to Black Americans, and that is uh, an American failing. Yeah, you mentioned at some point how the injustices in American history or contemporary injustices stand out more starkly here because they stand against a background of values that are so universal. All men are created equal. You you don't hear these complaints as much in Brazil, you mentioned, for instance, even though they abolished slavery later than the United States because the values of slavery and hierarchy don't clash I don't know Brazilian history, so hopefully I'm not wrong in saying this, but those institutions don't clash as much with Brazilian founding documents the way they clash with the Declaration of Independence. There's this tension like, do we need to throw these things out or do we need to live up to a certain set of founding values? You see this in the pro-constitutional Black tradition. So you've got, you know, Prince Hall arguing very early, like, these are your principles, apply them fairly, right? And it's always the leverage that the Black community had in America was that we made these really radical claims about everyone being endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. 
I always tell my students, you know, I teach world civilization and my students are always like, oh my gosh, is every single society that we're going to sort of cover going to have slavery? And the answer is yes. Almost every civilization throughout history has had the institution of slavery. What makes sort of the intellectual tradition of the founding unique is that it's the enlightenment, right, that comes up with these ideas that all men are created equal and sort of applies it, right, uh, to the broader society. Of course, the American founding is sort of enshrining that liberal enlightenment tradition into a written constitution. And so I always tell them, like, what's unique about the United States is that we we, can, we sort of take took this idea about individual liberty and dignity and enshrined it within a document. And that's very, very radical and very, very different, right, than most uh, other civilizations in human history. Yeah, I think it was Thomas Sowell who first drew my attention to that, that the unique thing about some segments of the West, the United States and Britain and other segments, I guess, is that it's the first time that a serious anti-slavery movement was born. And that as a result of that, there is probably, I don't remember if he made this point, but this occurred to me. It seems like as a result of an anti-slavery movement forming, it's probably the case that we have a lot more documentation about the horrors of slavery in a way that wouldn't mm -hmm. exist in societies that didn't care to question it so much. I mean, it's not like anyone ever wanted to be a slave themselves, but I don't know if there's anything that predates this era in Western Europe and the United States where there is like a substantial anti-slavery per se, as opposed to free my people or something like that kind of movement. Rachel can probably speak to this a little bit more. I know that there, there were some anti-slavery writers all the way going back to the Greeks, right, and Aristotle, but they were a very fringe sort of group, right, Rachel? Uh, you're the philosopher. They were There were a couple of people who had written sort of, you know, about the complete abolition of slavery, but those ideas were considered extraordinarily fringe in Greece. But that's sort of all I can think of right off the top of my, my head. No, there are writings in the early church that are totally yeah. anti-slavery, and, and the idea is uh, who, how can you buy and sell the image of God? And that, I'm quoting there from an early writing. I'm not going to remember the name, but uh, an early church father. And then medieval period, there was serfdom, but not slavery in Europe. But it all reasserts itself, right, um, in the in the early modern period. And so, you know, which we could argue is economic in nature. I mean, once again, that that <laughs> might be Marcus's uh, area more than mine, but. I do think that what could be unique are the actual accounts, the slavery accounts. So it's one thing to make a philosophical argument that something shouldn't be done. It's another thing to try and sort of shock the conscience of people in an activist way in order to get them to do something different. And we do have a lot of that. You're right. In our abolitionist history, that's very unique. Why do you guys focus on the marketplace as a source of liberation? This is in the title and substantively throughout the book. This is not surprising to someone who is in the classical liberal or libertarian tradition, but it might be, it might seem like an odd choice for people outside of it. Do you want to say something about what's liberating about entrepreneurship and the marketplace? Yeah. So historically, I think, you know, from my point of view, um, when I think back about the most egregious injustices perpetuated against Black Americans, and even the 1619 Project, when they put together their Hulu uh, sort of docuseries, you know, focused on these injustices. And the injustices are almost always perpetuated by the state. Uh, if we think about the various different programs that we talk about in the book, right, we talk about the highways, we talk about the consorted effort on the FHA, right, redlining, um, etc. It just strikes me time and time again, as we sort of go back in the past and look at where the injustices originated, they almost always have government at their origin. And even going back to slavery, if you think about the protections that government provided for slaveholders, this did not occur within an organic market economy. Indeed, most many slaveholders uh, considered themselves anti-market or anti-capitalist, at least, right? George Fitzhugh, sort of these individuals in the South also argued that, you know, we provide a better life, um, the sort of paternalistic slaveholding tradition than those northern industrialists who have, quote unquote, slave labor. And so as a historian, looking back, it always struck me as odd when people argued that, you know, sort of free enterprise, market capitalism and entrepreneurship somehow were at odds with, with Black liberation, because we see people like Booker T. Washington, uh, even if you could think of W.B. Du Bois and the ways he used sort of liberal values of freedom of the press, Ida B. Wells, in order to sort of try and liberate themselves. They're clearly using market liberalism and market liberal forces to try and liberate themselves. So it always struck me as odd, the antagonism towards the marketplace. And as we dug sort of further on, we see Black Americans embracing the marketplace as a means to liberate themselves in the face of state-sanctioned discrimination.
Yeah, one of the first things we address in the book is the new historians of capitalism, right? Who This is where you get lines like the line from Kendi, where he says, you know, capitalism and slavery are born twins, uh, something like that, because the new historians of capitalism are saying, hey, a really great way to get rich and build an economy is to exploit and enslave people, because that's what we did. In the United States of America, we built all this wealth based on the backs of slaves. But what you find out when you really dig in a little bit, like in like in Ed Baptist's book, the the half has never been told, is that he's he's getting things really wrong, right? He thinks the cotton industry is fifty percent of the American economy; it's only five percent of the American economy, and he thinks that they're getting more work out of enslaved people through increased forms of torture, and actually they just grew the cotton balls a little larger, things like that. And so what you find is that the Southern slave economy made a few people rich a few plantation owners who were just a few families, and it made the rest of the Southern economy very poor, which is exactly what Adam Smith would have predicted. Um, why? Because slavery shuts out a sub a section of the population from improving their human capital, from moving to where their labor is most needed, from inventing things and buying and selling them, right? And so we're all poor because we're not exchanging with those people in our economy. And so it doesn't make them worse off and us better off. It makes all of us worse off, except for maybe the very few who are directly doing the exploitation. But I might even argue not them. I mean, look at look at Southern infrastructure, look at Southern industry. I mean, it was it was 100 years behind by the time emancipation came around. This was not an innovative society. And they were quite proud of that <laughs> fact, right? They were more feudal kind of in their in their culture. And so what you see is you have to clarify some of these things with people because we have such a constant yarn about the relationship between slavery and capitalism. We don't even use the word capitalism for that reason. In the book, we just use the word markets so that we can explain that, no, I mean, actually what makes markets work really well is people being free. Human beings being free is literally the basis of why markets work so well. They can move, they can innovate, they can improve, et cetera. So Baptist, his book, and the new history of capitalism, this is the scholarly bedrock on which the 1619 Project was built around, right? Which is my understanding, biased being a libertarian and reading people like Phil Magnus, is that there's like a decent amount of shoddy scholarship there. Does that kind of a consensus position among historians, or is it is it controversial? Is there a lot of people that think that these numbers are right around cotton or something, or is it pretty widely accepted that it's not so hot? Yeah, so I mean, I mean, economic historians have have dunked on this, right? The original uh, sort of source of the data that Baptist and others got it from have written papers or responses saying that the data was, you know, misinterpreted by him. So it's very clearly incorrect, and there's a consensus that it's incorrect. And you know, just to speak quickly on the sort of 1619 project, I mean, I do think there's some good quality essays in there. I want to I want to emphasize that. I think. Phil Magnus was recently at Huntington College where I teach, and he, I think, said that seven of the 10 essays, right, uh, are unobjectionable in terms of their, their essay on criminal justice reform is quite good, right? Uh, their stuff on culture is quite good. There's really only two essays, maybe three, that are problematic, and that, of course, is the new, the one based on the new history of capitalism, the sort of linkage of exploitation to capitalism, as if yeah. we could exploit our way to economic growth and prosperity, which I think is absurd. Um, yeah. And then uh, the other one, of course, being the the one about the American Revolution uh, being motivated, yeah. at least in part or in large part, by um, sort of a, 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 an argument to defend slavery, which um, everyone from Gordon, you know, pretty much every <laughs> – uh, I don't want to say every historian, but Gordon Wood, one of the preeminent sort of historians of for the American Revolution, looks at this and says this is absolutely 100 uh, percent incorrect. And of course, Phil Magnus uh, does a good job in his book as well. Right. 1619 Project, a critique. Well, it, it, you could argue that, uh, y you know, it's got to be true. And the critique has got to be true because it got the Marxists and the libertarians together. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was the Marxists, right, who Marxist historians who were also pointing out there is simply no evidence that the Southerners were afraid of, or anybody in the founding was afraid that England was trying to free the slaves and that that was part of their motivation. There's just no evidence for that. And so it, it kind of cracked me up that a lot of those interviews were on the uh, socialist website, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. historians, but, but, but very well-heeled historians. I just had Deirdre McCloskey on the show and she was bringing up this, this same point that the damage done to the enslaved people is not commensurate with the wealth generated to the surrounding society. I think she gave the example of you can stick up, you know, a convenience store and traumatize and injure the store clerk or something and steal a hundred bucks 
and the damage done might be way out of proportion to the gain to you. You don't get as much gain as the damage you caused. So slavery, while it certainly did horrible things, didn't generate great things, even for the white society, maybe for the ti a tiny minority of slave owners themselves. And not even them, if you take ordinary moral and psychological considerations into yes. account, um, they're right. not better off for being bad people. I think it's really worth, and I won't remember the name, but there, there was a researcher that we talk about in the book who actually goes county by county all over the world and looks at areas that uh, had slave harbors or a slave, uh, an active slave trade, and then looks at their economies now. And you can see a very clear pattern. This is Robert E. Wright, uh, where I got some of this um, information. What's this book you called? Can, uh, well, Robert E. Wright's book is called The, the Pollution of Slavery, I, I think, it, or that might be the subtitle, but um, The Pollution of Slavery. Uh, and and he uh, refers to this researcher who goes county by county. And you can just see that that even today, the economies in these places are far behind other areas that are comparable in every other way besides the fact that they didn't have slavery. And so the evidence is pretty overwhelming for the classical liberal view that we've had ever since Adam Smith, right? Slavery is neither moral nor efficient. Do you think that the negative, the detrimental effect is worse for the places that engaged in the slave trade than it is for places that engaged in just widespread slavery? I believe that's what the evidence shows. So you can see a kind of gradation there. Um, that that if the slave trade itself was occurring in that place, it was even worse. And we know for sure, I mean, if you look at Africa, we can go all the way back to the slavery that was occurring between Arabia and Eastern Africa, which was hundreds of years before the mm -hmm. transatlantic slave trade. Uh, you can see how, for instance, in that case, it was also, it was a, there was a gender imbalance, right? So they wanted females, especially in the transatlantic slave trade, we wanted males, especially. And that gender imbalance, but also just pure removal of the population has been totally devastating to Africa as a continent, uh, economically speaking. And so, you know, there's a very good reason why Africa has lagged behind the rest of the world. And part of it was because just huge portions of their population were simply taken. And yes, they were complicit in many cases in that trade. And what it did is it displaced their organic markets. So their markets of cotton or of fruit or of sugar, you know, whatever it is that they were growing got replaced by the slave trade, which then undermined their own local economies because they were losing their own people and having that sort of demographic hit on their economy. And so it's, you know, we're still dealing with the fallout from that today. Hey, everybody, this is Chris Kaufman. And I just wanted to take a minute to thank everybody so much for listening to my show. This has really been a dream come true for me to be able to speak with scholars that I admire and read books every week that I'm always excited to read. This is still a small show, still a new show, still growing. And I appreciate everyone listening so much. If you want to help me grow my show, the simplest thing you can do is to write a review, just a short review, a sentence or two on Apple Podcasts, or just recommend it to a friend. So I'm just reaching out to you to beg you humbly on my knees to please do that. I'm going to try not to bug you too much about it, but here I am bugging you. Anyway, back to the show. Something I'm really curious about and have been is the various ways through history that slavery has affected incentives today and the descendants of particular slaves, how their fortunes today might differ. So I'm, well, I've got two questions and I'll start with, are there differences in the Americas, for instance, in the particular structure of slavery that redound today? For instance, I, I seem to recall learning that there were some areas in the Caribbean, maybe, that allowed slaves to keep private plots of land. And that cultural effect of fostering some level of independence and entrepreneurship worked out much better than areas where slaves were not allowed to keep a private plot and were not, therefore, able to develop habits of independence and entrepreneurship or something. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, so we actually do talk about the ability of some enslaved people in the United States were given little plots that they were allowed to farm for themselves. 
And some of them did use these in an entrepreneurial way. And it's it's actually quite a contrast seeing how hard they would work to be productive on that little plot versus almost a, um, sabotaging of their work for the master, as you can imagine, as any of us would do in the way we're, we're incentivized. And so we, we actually do have records of of enslaved people secretly making deals with other farms, getting found out by their, uh, you know, quote unquote master who's shocked to find out the amount of money they were able to make. Sometimes they sold to their own master. And so I actually think that there is an element of that in, in America uh, as well, and that Black Americans have tended to be very entrepreneurial. There was a, a large um, desire after emancipation to own their own farms, uh, a desire that was crushed, of course. Uh, by our political decision making, and they had to shift into sharecropping. Um, but even sharecropping felt more like ownership than working for wages, where you would still be under somebody with a whip above you, right? It would feel more like what you were doing on the plantation before. And at least with sharecropping, you felt this is my little area, and then I make my percentage. And so, yeah, I think those differences can matter a lot. It can also matter a lot, like how big the group of enslaved people is. So if you're one or two enslaved people on a farm, those were often more familial relationships just because how could they not be? You know, you're working side by side every day um, versus a plantation owner who is afraid of rebellion from hundreds of slaves and is going to be so much more cruel and oppressive and distant in order to protect himself, basically. Um, but at the same time, on the big plantations, you had a little more uh, things you could do in secret, right? Because people, you didn't have enough oversight. And so that was part of the story of the Black church, for instance, is that you could sneak out at night and worship at night and develop in these hush harbors and develop the Black church slowly over time in a way that you couldn't if you were on a more isolated farm or just a few of you. So there's all sorts of things that can come into play in terms of both markets and civil society. Are you aware of any of any good studies that document contemporary differences from the descendants of slaves descending from groups or areas of the country that allowed more independent farming versus those that didn't? I think that there are higher incomes from Caribbean Black immigrants to the United States, and mm. some of that difference could be explained by that. Some of that difference could also just be selection effect of who immigrates. Um, so it's confounded. I don't know if there are similar studies within the United States. So I'll just say two things. One thing is that at least in Mexico, I know you were able to buy yourself out of slavery. And that's actually sort of how it ended in Mexico is uh, is that people, you know, that that was done sometimes in the United States, but oftentimes it wasn't allowed. So there would be a state law against freeing your slave unless you sent them to another state or something that they didn't want to do. This is another way that the state supported and actively suppressed. Yes. And so in other places, you could buy yourself off, so to speak. And I think that could that could obviously make a difference. And, and just unilateral manumission from the slave owner was also not always allowed, right? That's right. Yeah. So people oftentimes felt trapped. I mean, there are actual cases. There was a famous Methodist case that actually had to do with the split in the Methodist church where the, the slave owner said, I have two teenage slaves. They don't want to be moved to another state where they know no one. And I'm not allowed to manumit them without sending them away. They're not allowed to be in the state as free Blacks because they didn't want too many free Blacks. And so he said, I'm basically just keeping them as slaves just for their own kind of protection because I don't know what else to do. And they wanted him to be, you know, kind of legalistic about it and free the slaves because Methodists didn't believe in slavery. So it was like a very contentious question. And the other thing I'll throw in here is that free Blacks, the descendants of free Blacks in America today are consistently far wealthier than the descendants of actual slaves. You can see a huge difference just between people who had their freedom, even though they were still oppressed for their race, they had their freedom and weren't actually enslaved versus those who are dealing with the legacy of slavery. So two things. One, for audience members who don't know, manumission is just a fancy word for freeing. That's you can free your slaves, manumit them. And my next question was, and you just answered this, but I, I'm wondering if you have any specific recommendations for works that go into this, is documented differences today between people who were descendant of slaves freed from the Civil War versus freed earlier, like in the 1830s in the North or something, versus those who were freed even earlier in the colonial era. Is there like a dose-dependent effect on how many generations of freedom you're descended from and how well people are doing today. Has anyone attempted this kind of study? 
I'm not aware of it. I would think it would be fascinating if they had, but I know that data about free Blacks, but I'm not aware of a, a deeper study on that. And to that point, Chris, I think that also those those families and those people who ultimately escaped the Jim Crow South, right, earlier, uh, I think they had better outcomes economically, right? So the faster you yeah. got out of, uh, you know, the, the environment of state-sanctioned state uh, discrimination, right, the more economic opportunities you had. And even though Northerners were still, by and large, racist, um, right, didn't believe in sort of the equality of the races, um, you still had better outcomes, right, than people who remained in the South for longer. Yeah, some of it was just the existence of cities. So yeah. Robert Higgs points this out. A really great book is Robert Higgs' Competition and Coercion, which is all about post-emancipation up to 1910, uh, Black economic history. I highly recommend this book. It is so good. And Robert Higgs, of course, is the famous author of Crisis and Leviathan, um, very important libertarian, author. yeah, economic historian. And uh, he does such a great job in that book. And he points this out, which is sometimes you just needed to get to where you could get better jobs, right? In the North, there were more cities. You know, there were just more urban areas where there was more opportunity. And so being able to get there in the first migration and then the second migration made a big difference. What's interesting now is that a lot of Black entrepreneurs are moving back south. Um, it's Houston and Dallas and Atlanta, you know, and places like that. I mean, literally the top 10, and I can find this website for you if you want it, the top 10 best places for Black entrepreneurship in the United States, uh, nine out of 10 of them are in the south. And so you have this interesting migration back now. Uh, and I think to areas where, frankly, there's more economic freedom. I mean, look at Houston. Houston has no zoning laws or even, you know, Democratic mayors in places like Atlanta. You know, they're they're in a, a group, uh, African-American community that tends to vote Democrats. So they're Democrats. But when you look at what they actually do, they're very pro-business. You know, they're very pro-market. Marcus, you were saying something earlier that I think is is really important and that this book addresses is how often government is at the bottom of certain forms of oppression that people might not think are government sanctioned in the first place. I mean, there's this standard like Gary Becker analysis that, you know, under free market conditions, discrimination doesn't pay because if you try to pay someone less than their market wage because you're racist, well, another employer can pay them a little bit more and bid away your workers and that source of competition will slowly erode discrimination. It doesn't mean it's impossible, but it means it's expensive and it's a reason to think it should go away over time. Well, then if you see discrimination, one thing to say is, okay, well, that analysis must be wrong. Another thing to say is maybe we're not in free market conditions. And segregation is, is one example. You might think competition would cause lunch counters to stop segregating so much. But that wasn't just a spontaneous result of white racism. There were actual laws that held up segregation. So I'm just wondering if, if you want to give some examples, maybe some underappreciated examples of where state governments or even the federal government actively supported racist outcomes, segregation, actively kept black people legally disadvantaged in ways that were not just a result of spontaneous white racism. Yeah, so there are lots of examples, obviously, and we detail them in the book. I think I want to touch on maybe two just real quickly. And the first, um, of course, Rachel and I detail, we talked a little bit about sharecropping, but uh, I think the sort of analysis of, you know, it, it costs, right, to discriminate is shown in in sort of that example of sharecropping. The, the the people who discriminated the most against sort of their sharecroppers, their sharecroppers could go and bid up their, right, uh, their shares elsewhere. And that's what we see over the course of the of the nineteenth late 19th century is – um, that even people engaged in sharecropping, which, you know, Rachel and I don't think is a great system, right? Can or you briefly just this, say ex what the system of sharecropping was for the audience? Yeah, Rachel, do you mind just defining it real quick? Yeah, so you could you could go and work for a wage, but as I said before, you didn't really want to do that because you've still got your foreman, you know, whipping you, right, um, to keep you going. With sharecropping, you're given a certain section of land, and then you keep a percentage of the produce, and the owner has, gets the rest. And so oftentimes, and, and whites participated in sharecropping in huge numbers too, um, poor Southern whites. And so what you would do is at least you felt like you were running the show, right? You could decide what hours you worked and things like that. And you could keep the produce in terms of your percentage. But if your percentage was 10% or something, uh, right? Of course, the owner would want to keep that as low as so possible. It's more like paying a large tax than being actively yeah. overseen as a slave. 
Right. And so what what happened was you had one more freedom. You know, you didn't have courts that would care about your property rights or anything like that. But you did have the freedom to move, which means you could go over to Farmer Jones and say, hey, I'll work for you for 20 percent. And so over time, they were able to bid the farmers against one another and actually push up their shares as high as 50 percent, where it's really starting to pay off to put in more work uh, on your farm. So, you know, once again, not the greatest. They Everybody really wanted their own farms, um, but 40 Acres and a Mule was canceled after nine months by Andrew Johnson. And so, you know, we settled for sharecropping. It was better than nothing. Yeah, one of the one specific example um, that I think is really telling about the ways in which government basically forced segregation upon unwilling populations, both black and white, is the case of streetcars. So there's an article, a famous article by Jennifer Robach about the ways in which streetcars were segregated. And what she does is she does a she has case studies in all these different Southern cities to take a look at like, where did these laws originate from? Was there already segregation on the streetcars? And then government came in and just you know, sort of solidified the segregated, you know, sort of sitting arrangements. And what she found actually is that whites and, and black Southerners basically mingled to, to at least a certain extent on the streetcars. And that, you know, when what ultimately happened is that, you know, the companies were opposed to the segregation laws being put down because it was much more costly for them to run two separate train cars, for instance, or streetcars um, to, to force sort of, you know, segregated areas um, and so what actually happened is it was local governments in which basically whites were willing to vote for sort of politicians to force segregation because, um, you know, they didn't want to pay for it in the Becker model by, by higher fares or whatever, but they're willing to vote uh, for it. But interestingly, when it was implemented, oftentimes on streetcars, um, whites would actually like buck the fact that they couldn't sit in the back of the streetcar. Or uh, there was one famous example. There's one example of a man who got on the tr on the streetcar and he was um, really sweaty from working and stuff. And there were three white ladies who were sitting in the front uh, sort of seat. And he comes in and he doesn't want to sit next to them because he smells bad. <laughs> and so he goes to the back of the streetcar and he gets arrested. He gets arrested because he refuses to sit um, where he's supposed to sit. Um, and there are boycotts, of course, from 1895 to 1905 by um, black patrons. Um, and they come up with some really fascinating and interesting ways to try and fight against this, including creating their own uh, companies. A little later on, they also developed jitneys, which were a little like cars that would uh, take people from place to place um, to so try and get around Uber, Uber. Yeah, yes. free Uber, Uber, Uber that ultimately got uh, banned, of course, or regulated out of existence. But streetcars are an interesting example. You would think that the segregation would come from from the people, right, from from whites uh, or from the companies. But that wasn't the case. It was governments that coerce and force that upon the companies and upon an unwilling populace. And in reality, and according to the Robach article, people were still not complying like years later. Um, they were just not complying. So the, there's oftentimes these, these rules that are on the books, but, but businesses sort of not complying. And I think there's other examples of that across the South as well, where companies would have liked to have provided integrated services, but are not allowed to, right, uh, because of Jim, uh, Jim Crow uh, legislation. Yeah, I wanted to add, everyone should read The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. This Great is book. such an important book. Yeah, it's just excellent. And and I was very surprised to learn that a lot of the um, redlining efforts that the Federal Housing Administration undertook was actually creating artificial segregation, you know, segregation that didn't wasn't there before, right? And so it was common around a factory to have sort of an Irish street and an Italian street and a Polish street and a black street. And, you know, it, people were very close to one another. They might not have been on the same street, but they were on the same neighborhood because they all worked at the factory. And over time, they started to push the whites out to the suburbs and then relegate the blacks to the inner cities and refuse to insure their mortgages so that they didn't have home ownership and so forth. Uh, and, and that happened to other communities too, not just, not just black people. But the point is, is that it was very much a social engineering kind of effort. And I can say the same for what Marcus is talking about in the South. Southerners had a terribly racist system, but they lived together. They lived near each other. They lived in the same households, right? And so to separate them was very inorganic. It was very artificial. And that was pushed by the white supremacists because they didn't want intermarriage and things like that. Um, if you go up to the North, Northerners sound a lot less racist, but they don't want you living anywhere near them. 
right? And so you have all these sunset laws. You have highly, the most segregated cities in the United States today are Minneapolis and Cincinnati and St. Louis. They're not in the South, right? Uh, because white people in the North weren't used to black people. And so they didn't want to live near them. And so, yeah, you get this very artificial kind of imposition going on with Jim Crow. Do you guys want to say something about cities like Mount Bayou and these independent communities that were founded by Blacks in the South? I don't know if they were founded in the North. I find it super inspiring, but I'm also just curious how these cities were founded. Were they just were they literally independent from the legal structure of the states or what was the interaction between some of these cities and state law enforcement or local law enforcement or federal or, or whatever? So my understanding, I mean, once again, the per best person to have on to talk about this would be uh, my advisor, my graduate school advisor, David Beto. I mean, and I would, did. Oh, <laughs> you had him on. OK, great. Yes. <laughs> and so he's he's the guy who would have all the answers right off the top of his head. But my understanding is that these were oftentimes incorporated within the normal sort of like state processes. But they were they were founded specifically right to, to have, be a black community where black Southerners, black Mississippians, in the case of Mumbai, could come together and create vibrant communities where they didn't have to worry about the white citizens council or the KKK or other things like that. Um, and they are extraordinarily inspiring, right? When you see the type of economic prosperity that some of these communities were able to produce, um, we also see, you know, there are also just neighborhoods that are extraordinarily prosperous in places like Memphis, for instance. Ida B. Wells is part of an extraordinarily prosperous neighborhood in Memphis um, that ultimately, you know, doesn't completely disappear, but declines because there are a lot of, you know, Black Americans leave because of uh, lynchings that occur there. Same thing in Greenwood, right, uh, in Tulsa. Um, but uh, the Mon Bayou example, um, and there, there are hundreds of these across the South, right, of free communities where people came together, voluntarily associated, developed the skills, provided, uh, you know, created a marketplace free of intimidation, discrimination. And the interaction with, with the state, I think, uh, is a tenuous one, right? Because if you think about um, the case of Black Maverick, uh, T.R.M. Uh, Howard, T.R.M. Howard, T. R. M. Howard. Um, you know, when he starts to speak out, right, against um, the various different restrictions and against the White Citizens Council, um, he doesn't get support from state troopers, right, in the, in, the, in the law enforcement, white law enforcement. And so they have, you know, these communities had their own sort of police um, and other things like that. And of course, in his case, he would oftentimes take matters into his own hands, um, you know, loved guns, uh, was armed frequently, uh, including to protect <laughs> Emmett Till's mother during the trial um, of the men who had killed her son. Um, and so, uh, yeah, those are those are amazing examples of Black Americans embracing free enterprise um, and ultimately self-segregating away from white communities because they thought it was the only way, right, that they could ensure themselves that they wouldn't be targeted uh, by violence and discrimination. Yeah, I, I, there's a couple of like fun facts about these Freedmen's Towns that I, I should share. I think one of them is that some of the most interesting thinkers come out of them, like T.R.M. Howard, but also Zora Neale Hurston. Her dad was the mayor of the Freedmen's Town in Florida, oh, where wow. she grew up. And Black people did everything in the town. I mean, right. And so her, you know, her famous line about, I don't understand, you know, when people discriminate against me, I don't get angry. It just astonishes me. Why would they deny themselves the pleasure of my company? Uh, it's such a great line. And I think there's a confidence that comes out of the Black Americans who are in those towns because they're doing everything themselves, right? And they're not under this sort of oppressive gaze, right, of of, of uh, people who are calling them less than. So I think it's really interesting. I, I know that there were a bunch of incorporated ones, but there were also a bunch of unincorporated ones who just never bothered to register with the state. And one of the most interesting fun facts about them is that some of them actually opposed Brown v. Board of Education. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason they did is because they were very proud of their local Black school. They did had, they had never been mixing with whites, and they didn't feel that they needed to do it now, you know? And so it might explain some of Zora Neale Hurston's pushback on Brown v. Board and so forth. It was they were very independent, strong communities that I think generated uh, very creative people. Another example is uh, Clarence Thomas. You know, Clarence Thomas grew up in the Gullah community, the Gullah Geechee community. He didn't speak English, basically, until he was like nine um, because he spoke Gullah. That's one of the reasons why he's so quiet. Um, and doesn't say much on the court. But it's just interesting to me that he had such an, uh, you know, unique, but also just deeply Black American experience, and yet traverses his own way, right, through American politics and, and thought, uh, and doesn't feel beholden necessarily to the expectations of what, uh, you know, Black Americans need to be doing. And if anyone wants to hear more about TRM Howard, 
Really interesting guy. I had David Beto on to talk about his and his wife's biography of TRM Howard on uh, episode 11. So check that out. And I didn't know that he was your advisor, Marcus. So that's really cool. I love David. What role did civil society play in black life that is underappreciated, especially as it pertains to mutual aid societies, since we're talking about David Beto? Yeah, mutual aid societies were extraordinarily important for black Americans, especially in the South, in a place where they couldn't engage in politics uh, and a place where they were obviously sort of excluded oftentimes from the public uh, sphere. And what mutual aid societies often were is they served as sort of insurance. They provided insurance for their members. So you get health insurance, life insurance, uh, sort of sick insurance, if you will, uh, from uh, from your mutual aid society. You know, everybody would chip in, you know, a nickel uh, or whatever it was. And then, you know, if, if Chris was sick, Rachel and I would go over to Chris's house and make sure that Chris was actually sick, right? And once we verified that he was sick, uh, they would pay out um, a certain amount of money. And so they served as a safety net at a time before, you know, the government played that role in the 1930s. That's Beto's uh, probably most famous book, From Mutual Aid to the Welfare State. It tracks that evolution of civil society providing those types of you know social safety net to the government providing it. So they played that role. But what we found as we were doing research for this book is they played a really important civic role as well um, at a time when, you know, as I said, Black Americans were oftentimes excluded from politics. You could be the president of your local chapter, right? You could go and you could learn about um, the Declaration of Independence. You could learn about the Constitution. You could read the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment and know, right, that you weren't getting a fair deal or a fair shake out of the American system. And interestingly, the mutual aid societies also provided a foundation for the later civil rights movement, especially the actions of the NAACP, because they trained Black lawyers um, very early on because they had to fight a whole slew of lawsuits uh, by white mutual aid societies who didn't like the fact that um, the Black Elks called themselves the Black Elks, right? The Elks, which was the White Elks, literally sued them. And so the, the Black Elks had to train lawyers in order to defend themselves and ultimately won that battle um, before the courts. They got to keep their name. And many of those lawyers ended up going and and um, being employed in the NAACP after it was founded. So mutual aid societies, I think, were extraordinarily important to building that civil society, right, that robust civil society, and providing a foundation upon which the civil rights movement was able to ultimately be successful, right, uh, some 50, 60 years after um, this foundation was created by uh, mutual aid societies, but also, you know, the Black church, of course. Yeah, we we decided to do actually a whole chapter on the Black Church because Lincoln and Mamiya call it the cultural womb of Black America, and it you know be I think partially because it's a, it's an area of life where you're not being ruled by whites, you know you're not being told what to do and you're not being overseen, and so your dignity and your leadership is respected there. And not only did a lot of these institutions that Marcus is describing come, in, come out of that, but also an intense desire to read, because, of course, uh, Black Americans were Protestants. They wanted to read the Bible. And uh, Higgs actually points this out as well. He says this may have been the largest leap forward in literacy in the in history thus far, um, basically zero after uh, emancipation, getting to 80 percent literacy in 1930. And so, you know, Black Americans are building schools, Sunday schools, church schools, you know, uh, cooperating with Northern um, funders, you know, doing anything they can to build up their education, obviously starting um, the trade school movement with Booker T. Washington, the National Negro Business League. And so I think what's often underestimated because so much was destroyed in the 1960s and on is just how much social capital Black Americans had built up among themselves through the self-help of the group Black economy. And it was actually went very deep, very strong families, very strong neighborhoods, schools, churches, fraternal organizations, et cetera, so that between 1948 and 1966, you have Black poverty cut in half from something like 87% down to the low 40s. And you're thinking, what? You know, people go, well, wait a second, you know, the 1964 Civil Rights Act hasn't even happened yet. You go, yeah, but if you spend decades building up your social capital and your education, uh, you know, through all of that period, and then the economic boom of the 1950s hits, you can ride that wave right out of poverty. And so what's so incredibly frustrating is that Black America was in many ways right on the edge of breaking through, 
when we started in with urban renewal, building the highway systems through their neighborhoods and the terrible debacle of the welfare state. And so it's just such a sad and tragic story that this community that was really breaking out of this long history of oppression was then crushed by the unintended consequences of these terrible federal policies. Can you say something about the way the highway system affected Black communities? Yeah. So you want to think about the fact that the federal highway system is the largest federal project outside of war thus far. So this is an incredible amount of money. And this money is being handed out to municipal leaders all over the country. And these municipal leaders are building up their political machines because that's what you do when you've got money from the federal government, right? Uh, You've got goodies to hand out and contracts to hand out. So they're building their political machines. And then when they look at what neighborhood they want to place these highways in, they're going to pick the poorest neighborhood. They're going to pick the neighborhood that they're most prejudiced against. They're going to pick the neighborhood that doesn't look nice to them. And they're going to mow right through it. And what they do is they pick it very specifically to divide between the white part of town and the black part of town or out west between the white part of town and the Latino part of town. So not only do you destroy whatever whatever neighborhoods were actually where the highway was, but then you lock into the inner city those who are still there with this huge wall of concrete. Right. And at the very same time, you have urban renewal, which James Baldwin called Negro removal coming through, you know, quote unquote, slum clearance, coming through to knock down all the high density housing, which once again, it may not have looked very fancy to you, but these were upwardly mobile working class families and you just scatter them to the four winds. You build low density housing in their place and they have nowhere to go. So they're now displaced to the second ghetto. And so the point is, is that a lot of the social capital that had been built relies on the geographic togetherness, right, of that of that main street, of that neighborhood, and it really gets scattered. And that is that is what is so deeply disturbing about what was done in that period. And a lot of people like the idea of lower density housing, but just because I mean, maybe it looks prettier, but just because you build it doesn't mean it's affordable. It's going to be more expensive than the high density housing that it replaced. Right. It's a lower supply. And that happened to other communities as well. I want to emphasize this. You know, we hear about these things from the Black community uh, in many cases, but Jewish communities, immigrant communities, other communities also suffered from all of these policies. And I think one of the things that was so heartbreaking about these stories, right, um, in The Color of Law, he talks about this. There were there were routes that could have taken these highways, you know, through a different part of town or completely around. And, you know, these neighborhoods didn't have to be destroyed. They were purposefully uh, destroyed. There were vibrant cultural centers, as, as Rachel says. And, you know, one of the things that we really try to emphasize in the book, especially near the end, is that, you know, government's really good at destroying things. It's not very good at actually putting things back together. Once you destroy civil society, once you destroy the ties that bind communities together, you can't just create a government program to reconstitute that. And I think that's a really important takeaway from the book. Yeah, destruction's easier than creation. How does your approach to addressing oppression and struggles in the Black community in general, how does it differ from the critical race theory tradition, people like Richard Delgado or D'Angelo or Kendi, how does your guys' approach differ from theirs? And how is it similar to? Right. And so one of the things I, you know, I always give uh, CRT credit for is that if you go back and and you you look uh, in our legal history for ways in which um, exclusion and oppression got built into our legal system, you will succeed in finding those. And and they have. They've been good at finding uh, these terrible examples in our legal history. The difference is that they're assuming that this is part of liberalism. So there is um, hostility towards, or at the very least, very deep suspicion of liberalism in general, the idea that you would treat um, citizens neutrally. Um, right, that the government would try to be as neutral as possible between yeah. citizens. Yeah. And so um, what that means is that they're assuming that because these things happened at the same time, they were the result of the same political philosophy. And what we're arguing is, no, 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 classical liberalism in terms of an actual practical experiment in the United States of America is only 250 years old, which means that it was bogged down with the baggage of old institutions that are not a part of liberalism um, by the nature of the philosophy at all. And and actually, we see this very clearly among many of the founders who knew 
that uh, slavery in particular was completely incompatible with a free society and that if it wasn't gotten rid of, it would spell the doom of the republic. And that was said very overtly in me uh, by many of the founders and by some of the anti-federalists as well, you know, made the same point. And so it's not as though people weren't aware these don't mesh. They knew that they didn't mesh, but they were stuck or saddled with this. And you can see that where Jefferson, in his original version of the Declaration, complains about King George imposing this system on them that is so deeply unjust, right? And he says, you know, I, I tremble when I think that God is just. I mean, I mean, Jefferson was not kidding around and actually experimented for a long time in his life with different ways that we could possibly end slavery. He could just sort of couldn't work it out. And so uh, I think we have to acknowledge that there was a early acknowledgement that these were incompatible. That was correct. They are incompatible. It almost did spell the doom of the Republic. We, we made it out by the skin of our teeth. And we absolutely must continue with the liberal project of neutrality between citizens, because that is, in fact, what Black Americans want to be a part of. They're saying most Black Americans are quite patriotic. They actually come out more patriotic than whites in polling, right? And why is that? Because they're not rejecting the American project. They're rejecting that part of the history, which was a rejection of the American project. And they're saying, we want in. We want into the great creativity and wealth and uh, freedom that America has promised. We want to be a part of it, too. Yeah, I think that if, you know, if I was sitting down in a room with them, I think the question I would ask them is what other economic system would have served Black Americans better? Given that they're a minority within the United States, right, given the sort of, you know, the fact that slavery is sort of baked into this, you know, have uh, racism, right, every civilization or every nation in Europe at the time was also filled with racists, um, a question, would, would a socialist economy had had served Black Americans better? Uh, would have a communist political structure have served Black Americans better? Uh, I think the answer to that is clearly no. When the elites or the people who are making laws are, and we'd all acknowledge, you know, uh, white supremacists in the late 19th century, especially in the South, if they have complete control over the economy and you have no free enterprise and no capitalism, right, uh, things are going to be a lot worse than they were uh, under the system and under the institutions that existed in the United States. And so, you know, I see, what I get from these folks is a rejection of sort of classical liberalism, of market liberalism, and I just don't see like what's going to replace it, right? What's going to replace it that's going to do a better job for Black Americans? Um, I don't know if Rachel could, you know, can jump in and defend them, <laughs> but I just don't see the positive project there. And that's one of the things that we've tried to do is offer solutions and, and a way to overcome this as a, as a whole holistic society, whereas I just don't see any sort of positive project coming out of those thinkers. Yeah, I think that they might defend themselves by saying, well, what we're really interested in is democratic socialism. You know, maybe we want to be like the Scandinavian countries. Of mm -hmm. course, Denmark doesn't want to be called socialists. They, they say we're very free market. We just have a thick welfare state. But one of the things that we've learned, not only, of course, are, the, are those countries quite small, but they've been historically very homogeneous. As they have uh, welcomed new immigrant groups, we have seen huge spikes in racism. And part of the reason for that, I think, is because when you have a very thick welfare state, when it's you and all your cousins, you're fine with it, right? Which is basically what Denmark is, you know, right? Or some of these North countries, it's them and their cousins, you know? But then when you have people come in who you don't feel are a part of who you are, now all of a sudden you really hate the fact that you're providing all of these things for them, free college, et cetera. And support and so for if, welfare states goes down with this kind of right. diversity. Exactly. And so if you're going to have a place like the United States, which is wildly diverse, right, one of the most diverse places in the world, you are going to have to have a much more minimal government. And that's one of the insights of classical liberalism. We get along better in very diverse communities when we agree on certain basic legal infrastructures and we leave the rest to civil society. And it's sort of hands off, live and let live. That's the power of that uh, perspective. And so I don't think they can get out of it by saying, well, we just want to have, you know, more workers on the boards of companies or we want, right, all of these sort of European ideas. You think, well, actually, you're going to end up having more problems with a diverse community if you go that way. You know, Germans don't let Turks become citizens, right? It's, it's a different place than the United States. So take that into account when you say you want their system. So what are some of your central suggestions for contemporary reforms to help the Black community? I'll start, and then Rachel, if you want to take us home, you can. Um, my, I mean, um, first, one of the things that we really we emphasize is getting out of the way, 
uh, just getting out of the way of Black entrepreneurs and Black Americans and allowing them to truck and barter uh, and do all the things that they want to do. We need to get rid of occupational licensing restrictions. We need to reform zoning or eliminate zoning. We need to end the war on drugs, decriminalization, or something along those lines. That would be a heck of a way to sort of start uh, by removing the impediments, right, to Black entrepreneurship uh, and to Black flourishing. Uh, and then we need to pursue policies that encourage economic growth. Because when we see Black Americans getting out of poverty, it's almost always when we see uh, large, you know, large numbers in terms of economic growth. So a pro-growth policy and then eliminating the impediments to Black entrepreneurship uh, and Black flourishing, that would be a great place to start. Yeah, a really good read is Black Boom by Jason Riley, where he talks about the fact that after the corporate tax cut in 2017, Black poverty actually dropped to 18%. It was the first time in our history that it's dropped below 20% between 2017 and 2019. Of course, with the rise of COVID, we don't know what would have happened if that if things hadn't gone the way they did, because it's back up to 20 now. But you saw that huge growth because of that pro-growth mentality. And so um, we talk about uh, educational freedom, which is another entrepreneurial area. We need people who are in their own communities and know their own communities using their creativity to think about how to educate these students in a way that meets their needs. Very, very important to have competition and variety uh, in order to solve difficult problems. So that's very important to us. And then finally, we talk about neighborhood stabilization, which is where you kind of take the insights that a lot of conservatives and libertarians make against the welfare state, where you're looking at the way that the welfare state sort of infantilizes people and makes them dependent. We turn those insights on ourselves and we say, how are we doing with our private philanthropy? Are we also making people dependent on us and that random coat drive or that random food pantry that we offer? Or are we thinking holistically? Are we honing in on a particular geographical area and saying, we want to help empower you. We want to acknowledge your dignity. We want to see you as a person who has something to offer with whom we can exchange, not just as a mere recipient that I just drop things on your head, you know, whether you wanted them or not. And so, uh, you know, there's there's a little bit of a superiority complex with the way we do charity. And so bringing in more humility, more love, more face to face um, kind of involvement. And you have lots of organizations that are working towards that, like uh, Bob Lupton's organization in Atlanta, Focus Community Strategies, uh, Brian Fickert's Chalmers Center, lots of places that are saying, let's rethink the way we do charity because we're not doing any better than the welfare state in the way that we treat people. And you both have already mentioned several wonderful books. Do you want to mention any other works that you think complement this work especially well? Yeah, I'm currently reading M. Nolan Gray's Arbitrary Lines. Um, and so I, I highly recommend that. I'm only about halfway through it, um, but it's on the history of zoning. Uh, and he makes the case that we should abolish zoning. So um, it's, a, it's a very provocative read. And I think uh, one that your listeners might really uh, enjoy. Yeah, the work of Robert E. Wright at AIER, I mentioned him earlier with um, Slavery as Pollution, but he's also got the, the book Financial Exclusion. He actually turns out a lot of really, really good work um, that that complements what, what we're writing about as well. And I also pulled on The Inclusive Economy by Michael Tanner out of the Cato Institute, which is a really good example of the economic freedoms. Um, that we can begin to embrace. I mean, really, we could go on and on, and we do have 800 footnotes, so there's lots of lots of book recommendations in there. I'm going to include those as well as your book on the show notes. Do either or both of you have any upcoming projects you want to plug? We have several. So, Marcus, talk about Roosevelt or Lane. Yes, I hope I hope you would. I, I was messaging with uh, David Beto, and he mentioned that. Yeah, so David and I have a edited collection coming out, hopefully in the spring of 2024. It's titled Rose Lane Says, which was the title of her column in the Pittsburgh Courier. And during World War II, Rose Wilder Lane, uh, who, of course, is uh, one of the mothers of libertarianism, uh, went to work for the most prominent Black paper um, in the country at the time. And she wrote op-eds for three years during the war. And during those three years, you really see her grappling with how her libertarian ideals apply uh, to Black Americans and grappling with some areas in which she was, you know, she was sort of blind to injustice. And so we're really hopeful. We've been able to get the rights to 84 of them. Um, I think there's 120 some odd, but some of them are just not 
they weren't preserved very well. They were on microfilm, so we had to go through it meticulously, right? Uh, transcribe them. I'll never forget uh, David Beta with his with his literal little uh, magnifying, um, glass. magnifying glass, trying to figure out what some of the ones were. I was like, I uh, love it. That's a true yeah. researcher right there. That's right. We were sitting in a coffee shop, and everyone's just looking at us, like, "What is this guy doing?" Um, but we've, uh, we've put together eighty four of those, um, and so they'll be released in the spring of next year. Um, that project is coming out with the South Dakota Historical Society Press, which does a lot of publications um, related to the Little House on the Prairie books and her mother. So we're really excited about uh, Rose Lane Says. And then Marcus and I are um, starting to put together the follow-up to this book. Um, one of the most delightful things to discover was that there was such a strong tradition of classical liberal pro-Black activism, uh, both from Black and white classical liberals. And so what we wanted to do was actually put these people all into one volume with some short biographies and so forth. And so we're starting uh, the research on that now. But it's really wonderful to realize that, for instance, William Lloyd Garrison and his whole crowd, Harriet Beecher Stowe, that whole group of abolitionists were actually very serious free marketeers almost radical, <laughs> you know, free marketeers. Like you want to I knew that about everything. Garrison. I, I didn't yeah, know yeah. And they were followers of Richard Cobden and, and Douglas, right? Frederick Douglas goes to England and, and studies Richard Cobden and, and you know, and and draws on the, the elimination of the Corn Laws for his view of the abolitionist movement. Um, and you can go on to talk about people like uh, Elaine, but even like two of the founders of the NAACP, um, who were very serious classical liberals, Villard and Story. Um, and were major, uh, majorly important in, in you know, the vision that we could use our own constitutional order to fight for the rights of Black Americans from an individualist perspective. So there's so much great stuff there, and we were so excited to find it, and actually to find that classical liberals don't really have a bunch of virulent racists. We can't find too many people in our tradition that bought in to a lot of the racism that was just very normal among uh, both conservatives and progressives. Of course, progressives uh, don't often admit just how deeply racist and eugenicist um, their tradition is. And yeah, so, we didn't get to talk about the progressive movement, but Illiberal Reformers yeah. is a wonderful book on that. Thomas, Thomas C. Leonard, so important. And so all of that to say, it was really kind of neat to see, wow, maybe these principles really do play out well in people's lives because we saw people really fight hard um, for Black Americans and, and reject the racism of their day. Yeah, I think that the the worst racism that I'm aware of that that you find in the quote unquote classical liberal tradition is what you would expect. It's it's these really really divided people who have like astonishingly pro liberty things to say in one breath, like John C. Calhoun, uh, right. and then and then are also like the most able defenders of slavery as a positive good. Right. Where can people find you? Well, Amazon, our book is on Amazon. It's like 13 bucks right now. We tried to make it very affordable. Uh, if you go to rachelfergusononline.com, you can read things that I write all over the internet. I'm on Twitter at Liberty Ethics. I do a lot on Twitter and uh, and uh, Facebook or LinkedIn as well. How about you, Marcus? Yeah, so you can you can find me on Twitter. I don't do as much as Rachel on Twitter. I, <laughs> I think Twitter is generally accessible. Uh, you can also find me on LinkedIn. So that's where I'm at. Well, my guests today have been Rachel Ferguson and Marcus Witcher, and their book once again is Black Liberation Through the Marketplace, Hope, Heartbreak, and the Promise of America. Rachel, Marcus, thank you so much for joining me on Ideas Having Sex. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Have a good day. Thank you for listening to Ideas Having Sex, where we have stimulating conversations on social science, philosophy, history, politics, and more. If you're a fan of what I do, please take a minute to subscribe to the show and to give us a rating and review wherever you listen. I'm Chris Kaufman. Thanks for listening.